in the final hours before the ascension, Jesus took his disciples to the Mount of Olives to give them their final instructions. Questions filled their minds. Who is this Jesus? Is this going to be the time when the kingdom of Israel is restored? With a myriad of questions that could have been asked, this is the only one that occupied their conversation. So, when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood before them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Jesus is gone. He has ascended into heaven. Now what do we do? Wait. Those two men, dressed in white, said that Jesus would come back in the same way as we have seen him go into heaven. Jesus will return. Maybe then the kingdom of Israel will be restored. The testimony of this event captured the hearts and minds of the first century church. Jesus is coming back. It wasn't long before rumors circulated that Jesus had returned and gathered together his elect. Fear struck the Thessalonian church. They heard a rumor that Jesus had returned, and apparently they were not part of the elect. Paul wrote his second epistle to the Thessalonian church as a means to calm their panic. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Paul laid the groundwork for faith in the soon coming Jesus. His writing brought clarity to a fledgling church adrift in apocalyptic rumors. During these years, the concept of a literal millennium was not clearly defined because John the Apostle had not penned the book of Revelation yet. The resurrection of Jesus Christ must be the starting point for the final millennium of God, known as the Day of the Lord. Paul and nearly all the first apostles strongly believed that the second coming of Jesus was imminent. It could happen any day. But as years turned into decades and decades into centuries, it became clear that in spite of their hopes, the millennium did not start with Jesus' resurrection. For nearly 200 years, Christians intensely expected Jesus to return and usher in his golden age. One might think this delay would create a crisis of faith in the early church, but it did not. Not all first century Christians shared the same beliefs nor was there an orthodoxy of correct millennium thinking. Differing opinions were accepted. Most early Christian thinkers were not troubled by the delay of Jesus' return, 
They were troubled by those who panicked and saw the second coming everywhere. Probably the first Hal Lindsay of the Christian Church was Papaeus, Bishop of Hierapolis in southwest Turkey, who wrote during the first decades of the second century. Papaeus strongly believed in a future golden age with Christ sitting on his throne, but he believed the event that ushered in the millennium was the resurrection of Jesus. Papaeus vividly described his imagery of paradise as growing vines with each having 10,000 branches and in each branch 10,000 twigs and in each true twig 10,000 shoots and in each one of the shoots 10,000 clusters and on every one of the clusters 10,000 grapes and every grape when pressed will give 200 gallons of wine and when any of the saints shall lay hold of a cluster, another shall cry out, I am a better cluster, take me, bless the Lord through me. Papaeus also wrote, There will be a certain period of a 1,000 years after the resurrection from the dead, when the kingdom of Christ must be set up in a material order on this earth. Papaeus is believed to be the first post-biblical author to describe the 1,000-year visible kingdom of Jesus Christ. Ignatius, Patriarch of Antioch in the early 2nd century, also affirmed the belief shared by Papaeus that the second coming of Jesus was imminent. He wrote, The last times are come upon us. Weigh carefully the times. Look for him who is above all time, eternal and invisible. Historical records from the early Christian church reveal that millennium theories proliferated everywhere, but two basic ideas rose to the surface. The material blessings theory came from the region of Ephesus in Turkey. Teachers of this theory emphasized the physical aspects of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Serinthus, a Gnostic who wrote at the turn of the second century, scandalized the Christian community when he insisted that the millennium would include nuptial blessings. These writings clearly envisioned the physical return of Jesus Christ and his future rule over a new heaven and a new earth following the resurrection. Papaeus was one of the chief supporters of this theory. The Cosmic Week Theory also known as the Six-Day Theory, came mainly from the area of Antioch in Syria, and this theory is based on one verse found in the second epistle of Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. This theory teaches that one spiritual day with God is equal to 1,000 years of human history. The teachers of this theory interpret this verse in Peter in a literal fashion instead of seeing its symbolic significance. This theory linked the seven days of creation with seven millennia of human history. Christians during this era calculated the age of the earth to 5,700 to 6,000 years old. 
this theory rose to the top of all the other millennial theories being taught. It spread from the east to the west around the Roman Empire. When the cosmic theory took root, it produced fruit. It can be found in the writings of nearly all famous Christian theologians throughout history. The theory surfaced during the Dark Ages in the writings of Abbot Adso of France in 950 AD and Giacomo Fiore in the 12th century. The theory can also be found in the early reformers of Martin Luther and John Calvin in the 16th century. Probably the most famous supporter of this theory was James Usher, Archbishop of Ireland, who published his work called Annals of the World in 1650. Usher used the Cosmic Week theory to calculate that the date of creation was the night of October 23rd of 4004 BC. William Miller, in the mid 19th century, used Usher's calculations to determine that Jesus would return in 1843. This theory has real staying power because it is one of the main linchpins of millennial theology today and the young earth creation theory. All the historical records from the early 2nd century, especially the Epistle of Barnabas and the Didache, indicate that the early church was pre-millennial. They believed that a literal physical return of Jesus Christ would usher in a literal millennium. The only sticking point was the event that would initiate the millennium. The debate centered around one question. Would the millennium commence with the resurrection of Jesus, or the resurrection of the dead, or the second coming of Christ? As the years wore on, one theory eventually became dominant. Those who thought about the millennium began to rethink the event that would initiate it. If the resurrection of Jesus did not start the millennium, Perhaps the second coming of Christ would. Justin Martyr, a second century theologian and writer, combined the two predominant theories of the cosmic week and the material millennium into his own unique form of eschatology. Justin did share much of the Millennium Doctrine taught by Papias. In his dialogue with Trypho, Justin affirmed his belief in the resurrection of the dead, who would reign with Jesus Christ for 1,000 years in a rebuilt Jerusalem. But Justin Martyr differed from Papias of Hierapolis in two ways. First. Justin Martyr refused to make eschatology a test of orthodoxy. He said, I and many others are of this opinion and believe that such will take place. But on the other hand, many who belong to the pure and pious faith and are true Christians think otherwise. Second, Justin Martyr linked the beginning of the millennium with the second coming of Jesus. He rejected Papias' assertion that Christ's resurrection began the millennium. Justin Martyr is the first post-scriptural writer who placed the millennium after the second coming of Jesus Christ. Therefore, he appears to be the first true pre-millennialist. Other second century theologians followed the lead of Justin Martyr and placed the millennium after the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
chief among these theologians was Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyons. This great bishop is best known for his vigorous defense of Christianity against the Gnostics in his book, Against All Heresies. Irenaeus followed his teacher Papias that the resurrected faithful will reign with Christ for 1,000 years in a renewed Jerusalem. However, Irenaeus, like Justin Martyr, rejected Papias' concept that the resurrection of Jesus was the initiating event. These two authors expected the millennium to begin after the coming of the Antichrist and the second coming of Jesus Christ. But Irenaeus differed with Justin Martyr in his belief that the last days commenced with the resurrection of Jesus, while Justin Martyr believed the last days would begin with the second coming of Jesus. Irenaeus' eschatology included a three and one half year reign of the Antichrist and a literal earthly millennium. He also strongly believed in the resurrection of the righteous and a return to the bliss of the Garden of Eden. Again, Irenaeus believed these events were eminent because he dated the beginning of the last days from the resurrection of Jesus, not his second coming. Justin Martyr and Irenaeus both wrote of the millennium as a far-off event. But late in the 100s, some Christians began to see signs that the millennium was imminent. The most worrisome of these were the Montantists. Montanism was a radical religious sect that arose around 150 AD in Hierapolis, Turkey, and the sect was named after its founder, Montantus. It's interesting to note that the bishop of Hierapolis at this time was Papias. Montantus was a Christian professing to be a prophet, who had two prophetesses ministering with him named Maximilla and Priscilla. His mission was to bring about a return to the simplicity of the early church and to announce the fulfillment of the prophecy of Pentecost. Some in the sect went so far as to claim that Montantus was the incarnation of the Holy Spirit. The Montantus believed that Jesus Christ would return to Phrygia in Asia Minor and set up his new Jerusalem. Because of this expectation, Montantus demanded a strict ascetic life. Montanus and his two female associates claimed in 172 AD that the millennium had begun and God had given them authority over the entire Christian church. They adamantly insisted that rejection of their proclamations was to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, thus committing the unforgivable sin. By the end of the second century, the Montantus sect rivaled the Orthodox Catholic Church for acceptance by the people. The Orthodox Catholic Church saw their status and position being challenged by this sect. Therefore, the mainstream church judged the Montantists as heretical and condemned their prophets and prophecies. Probably the most famous convert to the Montantist sect was Tertullian, the great theologian and apologist of the second century. He strongly advocated an apocalyptic eschatology that included Jesus returning soon. Tertullian scorned the earthly pleasures of Papias' materialistic millennium because he believed in the ascetic lifestyle taught by Montantus. Millennium fever 
can have serious consequences. The second century also had their fear merchants. The obvious delay in the second coming of Jesus Christ and the radical millennium declarations of the Montantists caused a considerable stir in the rank and file of the Christian community. Speculations about the millennium abound, and each new charismatic leader caused splinter groups to organize and fall into confusion. Something must be done. The theologian to tackle the problem was Hippolytus of Rome. He was stirred to action when he heard about two church leaders, one from Syria and one from Pontus in northern Asia Minor, who led their congregations into the desert to await the imminent return of Jesus Christ. People abandoned family and farm to follow these leaders. But when the allotted year passed, these congregations were devastated and lost their faith. He wrote, The virgins got married, the men withdrew to their farms, and those who had recklessly sold all their possessions were eventually to be found begging. How did Apollotus address the issue of the second coming of Jesus? He developed an eschatology formula that set an exact date for the second coming. Hippolytus used the cosmic week theory that taught that 5,500 years separated Adam from Jesus. He calculated that the second coming would occur in 496 AD. He worked out this date in his commentary on the book of Daniel. Hippolytus, placing the second coming of Christ so far into the future, diffused the millennium expectations of the Christian community. As long as Christianity was a persecuted religious sect, premillennialism ran high. The pain and suffering endured by the Christian community found hope in a premillennial future kingdom with Jesus having all authority. They viewed the millennium as 1,000 years of vindication and justice. The predominance of premillennialism began to cool with the Edict of Milan issued by Emperor Constantine and Licinus in 313 AD. This edict guaranteed freedom of religion in the Roman Empire. The hopes of the Christian community shifted from premillennial expectations to a new form of millennial thinking that included the changes seen in the Roman Empire. To understand a millennialism, we first must meet Augustine, Bishop of Hippo, who preached during the latter fourth and early fifth century. He developed the reputation as the greatest theological mind of his era. Augustine was originally a premillennialist, but eventually he retracted his views in favor of the new millennium theory known as amillennialism. Amillennialism was not truly a new eschatology. The theory predates Augustine by nearly 200 years to the writings of Origen of Alexandria in the early 3rd century. Augustine did something, though, that was unique with his theory. He cataloged and systemized amillennialism to the point that his theory usurped the dominant theory of premillennialism. What are the basic tenets of a millennialism. A millennialism teaches that the kingdom of God will not be physically established on earth through the millennium, but rather that Jesus Christ is presently reigning from his place in heaven. The doctrine teaches that Jesus is and will remain with the church until the end of the world 
and that the millennium began on the day of Pentecost. The doctrine also teaches that the primary responsibility for the church is to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Augustine insisted in his famous manuscript called The City of God that the book of Revelation is an allegorical historical text, not a book of prophecy concerning the end times. Augustine insisted that the millennium is the present church age and that the church now on earth is both the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. According to Augustine, when the church accomplishes its mission of world evangelism, Jesus would return and the judgment would occur. In 431 AD, the Council of Ephesus condemned the belief in a literal millennium as superstition. To be accused of superstition in the Roman Empire was a very serious charge even to this late date. According to several prominent Roman authors, including Cicero and Plutarch, superstition was an offensive religious belief or practice that deviated from Roman norms without regard for the rites, rituals, and traditions of Rome. Why is Augustine and amillennialism so important? The doctrines of Augustine became the official position of the Roman Catholic Church for the next 1,000 years. Augustine's amillennialism prevailed well into the Middle Ages. There is no doubt from the historical record that the apostolic church was premillennial. The theologians from this time period clearly anticipated a future literal return of Jesus Christ to this earth and a literal millennium. Should this be the case, then why did millennial hopes decline? The decline of premillennialism can be attributed to four factors. The first factor can be found in the fact that the anticipated events of the final days did not happen. Jesus Christ did not return and establish his kingdom. The second and third factors came with the ascension of Emperor Constantine to the throne of the Western Empire and his eventual unification of both halves of the Roman Empire. The political scene changed dramatically. By the middle of the fourth century, Christianity moved from being a disenfranchised, persecuted religious cult to the official religion of the Roman Empire. At this point, Christianity developed a strong orthodoxy and became an organized institutional religious system. The fourth factor can be found in the decline of the literal interpretation of the book of Revelation, especially chapter 20. The allegorical interpretation method introduced by Origen of Alexandria in the first part of the third century became dominant. The third, fourth, and fifth centuries saw a theological debate occur between the literal interpretation of the Bible and this allegorical method. This debate spilled over into the prevailing theory of premillennialism. Scholars in Ephesus and Antioch lean toward a literal interpretation of Daniel and Revelation, while scholars from Alexandria and Rome, especially Hippo, lean toward an allegorical interpretation of the book of Revelation. They tended to spiritualize much of the book. The issue that pretty much ended the millennium debate 
was the conquest of the Western Roman Empire by the Germanic Hordes and the Dark Ages. The bright shining light of the once great Rome became nothing more than smoldering ash drifting on the wind. For nearly two centuries, Christians earnestly anticipated Christ to return and rescue them from the bloody hands of Roman persecution. During these years, Christianity was the disenfranchised outcasts of Roman society. Historians agree that millennium theories abound among people who live on the fringes of society. This is especially true among the poor and persecuted. They also agree that apocalyptic fears arise during times of social instability and transition. During the first centuries of the early Christian era, premillennialism was the dominant view of Christian eschatology, and this view was filtered through the pain and suffering of Roman persecution and death. Premillennial beliefs gave hope to a suffering group of outcasts. Many of the early premillennial thinkers, such as Irenaeus of Lyons and Justin Martyr, understood the evils of the Roman Empire and looked to the coming of Jesus Christ with great hope. They maintained this hope even when martyred by order of imperial edict. We as Christians often filter our eschatology through the historical events that surround us. This is why apocalyptic thinking has the unique ability to reinvent itself with the changing seasons of history. In the fourth century, Christianity slowly made peace with the Roman Empire and millennium expectations of the church changed. Theologians like Augustine introduced a new millennium theory known as amillennialism that removed a literal interpretation of the Bible from the theological question. Since the church was at peace with the Roman Empire, premillennial hopes soon yielded to the allegorical understanding of amillennialism. Why did this theological change occur? The answer is simple. The social and political climate changed. Historical events filtered the prevailing theological understanding of the millennium of Jesus Christ. It's important we understand that our view of the millennium will often dictate our worldview and our politics. We see this filtering process in the eschatology of our early church fathers. But we also see this process in the body of Christ around the world today. Before you slip into the extremism of millennium fever, ask yourself one question. Am I filtering my understanding of end time prophecy through changing world events and social issues. How I honestly answer this question reveals the degree I am susceptible to the extremes of millennium fever.